Part 1 You'll hear a dialogue between a foreign student and a student union officer. As you listen, answer the following questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I'd like to know something about the British medical scheme. Yes, what's your question? Can I use British doctors if I fall ill? That will depend on how long your course of study is. If it is six months or more, then you are entitled to treatment from the British Medical Scheme, called the National Health Service, NHS, as if you were a British citizen. With the NHS, consultations with doctors are free, but you will be asked to pay something towards the cost of medicines. In 1987, this is £2.40 for each item of medicine. You are also entitled to free treatment in British hospitals. Always make sure the doctor knows you want treatment from the NHS, as doctors also take private patients, who pay the full cost of all their treatment. How do I make sure I can be treated by the NHS? If you are eligible for treatment, that is, you are registered on a course of six months or longer, then the first thing you should do is to register with a doctor. You should register with any doctor close to where you live. Local post offices have lists. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. All you need to do is visit the doctor or the doctor's receptionist during consulting hours and ask to be included on the doctor's list of patients. If the doctor decides to accept you, you will then be sent a medical card by post which will carry your National Health Service number. Take great care not to lose this if the doctor cannot accept you, try elsewhere or contact the local family practitioner committee. You can get the address from the post office or any doctor. Find out your doctor's consulting hours from the doctor or the receptionist and ask whether or not you need to make an appointment before seeing the doctor. Remember to be on time for any appointment you make. You can see him or her during those hours, unless you are seriously ill. If you are seriously ill, the doctor can be called out to see you. Once you have registered, you should tell your warden, landlord, landlady or a friend the name, address and telephone number of your doctor, so that if you are suddenly taken ill, the doctor can be called out to see you. I see. Could you tell me something about British hospitals? Yes. Hospitals provide specialist treatments, or treatment for which any kind of extended stay is required. Your doctor will recommend you to go if it is necessary. Casualty or emergency treatment following accidents is free for everyone. As not all hospitals provide such services, you should find out which local hospitals do in case you ever need treatment. How about dental care in Britain? You can find lists of dentists who give National Health Service treatment at local main post offices. You do not register with a dentist, but you should ask whether they are willing to give you NHS treatment. As dentists are free to accept or refuse patients and to provide private treatment only. If you are accepted, you should give the dentist the NHS number which is on your medical card. There is a charge for all dental treatment. For basic treatment, this could be up to £17. 
more extensive dental treatment will cost more if you are not registered with a doctor. You will have to pay the full cost of dental treatment as a private patient. You will have to make an appointment to see your dentist and should give notice if you are unable to attend an appointment or you will be charged for loss of time. You should try to have your teeth checked at least once per year by the dentist. From the NHS, you are entitled to a free six monthly checkup. Thank you very much. This helps me a lot. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to listen to two students talking about a presentation on time management. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi, Mark. What are you doing? Hi, Lucy. Well, I, I'm preparing this seminar on time management. I'm supposed to do a presentation on the topic next week. Ironic, isn't it? I'm probably the worst student when it comes to time management. I don't think you're that bad compared to some other people I know. Do you need some help with it? Yeah. I just don't know where to start, to be honest. When are you doing the presentation? I'm supposed to hand in the draft on Wednesday at 11am. The presentation is scheduled for 10am this Friday. That's not too bad. This gives you the whole weekend to prepare. Let's brainstorm some ideas, shall we? Do you want to get a pen and paper to jot down some thoughts? I think you should start with a broad general statement. For example, I read somewhere that organising time is a skill like learning to drive or tying your shoelaces. Then you could move on to discussing the common problems people have with managing time. That's not a bad idea. One of the common problems is putting things off. Yeah, you could also mention some common signs of this symptom such as last-minute holiday shopping, pulling off visits to the doctors or the dentists. Another problem is relying too much on your memory and not writing things down. Do you mean not keeping a diary or a planner to plan the tasks? That's right. For example, writing down what I need to do in a diary or planner helps me remember what I need to do and makes me more focused on the tasks for the day. Good idea. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. That reminds me of something I've been meaning to do for a while now. Anyway, I should also include some advice on how to deal with the problem, shouldn't I? Sure, you can talk about some ways of stopping procrastination. I guess making a to-do list can help one focus on what needs to be done. Definitely. Another way to deal with the problem is to prioritise and do the hardest job first, the one which requires the most effort and concentration. Also, my tutor recommended that I should break big projects into small parts with a specific goal. Having an action plan has worked for me. I usually make a list of small tasks I need to do to achieve a goal. Sometimes I just don't feel like getting down to work because a task seems too overwhelming for me to even think about. This technique helps me reduce psychological pressure. If I think of a project as a set of easily achievable tasks, don't you think? I know what you mean. 
I often feel like that myself with the statistics project I've been doing this term. I'm well behind, and the deadline is next week. I think setting deadlines and sticking to them can help one to achieve goals. You can discuss this aspect in your presentation too. A good point. Setting deadlines can also help one become more realistic about the time it takes to do tasks. Another point you could include is how to deal with interruptions. Okay, I guess blocking in time to handle unpredictable interruptions can help one stay focused. Not just that, some interruptions, such as phone calls, can be easily avoided by using answering machines, for example. Saying no, which is one of the most useful words in English, is also very effective. It can be tough sometimes, but you've got to learn to say it nicely but firmly. I think you've got enough ideas here to start with. Definitely. Thanks a lot for your help. I just need to type the ideas up and I think I'm all set. Do you think you can lend me your laptop for a couple of hours? Mm, I'm afraid I can't. I've got to finish my own project. Never mind. I'll use one at the library. You certainly know how to say no. <laughs> Learned it the hard way. Got to go now. Good luck with the presentation. Cheers. See you later. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation between a student and a driving instructor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 21 to 24. Hello. I'm going to be your driving instructor today. Are you ready to begin? Hi. Hope you don't mind. It's my first time driving a car. Of course not. That's my job. I teach people like you how to become a safe and responsible driver. So let's begin. Remember, the most important rule of driving Safety first. There are some steps to follow. First, you should put on your seatbelt. You should always remember to do that. In case of an accident or emergency, having a seatbelt on is of utmost importance. OK, I have my seatbelt on. Now what should I do? Start the car. Good. Now make sure that the steering wheel is in the proper position and that your seat is not too far or not too close to the pedals. I'm all ready to go. Should I shift into first gear? Don't forget to put the parking brake down. You don't want to drive with that up. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. If I have the parking brake on, I won't be able to accelerate. Yes, that's right. Now put the car in reverse and slowly back out of the parking space. Good. Put the car in first gear. When should I shift? Is it better to shift slowly or quickly? You can shift whenever you feel is appropriate. This means shifting should occur smoothly. Do not shift too slowly or you will stall. Shifting too fast will waste gas. Shifting is simple. Just remember to shift smoothly. To shift, you will have to push the clutch and then push the gas pedal. Now look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 25 to 30. Remember, smoothly is the key to good shifting. Like this? Yes, that's good. Now keep it slow. Don't drive very fast just yet. Be sure to constantly check your mirrors for oncoming traffic. Always be aware of everything that is around you, including three important things. Remember these three. People crossing the streets, other cars, and bicycles riding next to you. What should I do if I see a yellow light? Well, it's always better to brake instead of trying to run it. But if you're travelling at a speed where it's impossible to stop in time, then you should try to make it across the intersection. But remember, 
You should always try to stop. It's the safest way to avoid an accident. Even if I have to brake very suddenly? Yes, even if you have to brake suddenly. What about if a driver behind me is going a lot faster than I am? You should always be ready to move to a slower lane if a driver behind you is forcing you to go faster than you are comfortable with. Never try to speed up to accommodate a faster driver. You could risk an accident or a speeding ticket. It's better to let him go. That sounds like good advice. Be careful. There is a sharp turn up ahead. Remember to brake before turns. Otherwise, you might flip over if your speed is too high going into a turn. Got it. I know that I should always try to observe all traffic safety. That's right. If safety is not your first priority, it will make driving very dangerous for you and other drivers on the road. OK, park the car here. You did a great job today for your first day. I'll see you in three days. Thanks so much. I will see you then. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a conversation between two students. They are talking about the English bars. As you listen, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Kevin, could you tell me something about the bars? I have never been to a bar. You see, Steve, my classmate, has invited me to go to a bar tonight. I see. You know, the word bar means a room in a pub. We say the bar when we mean the part of that room where drinks are kept. Soon after you go into the pub, you'll realize that nobody comes to the tables to take orders or money. Instead, Customers go to the bar to buy their drinks. I see. People will go to the bar directly to get their drinks and don't wait for someone to come to take their orders. That's right. People don't queue at the bar, but they do wait till it's their turn. Oh, how do I pay? I mean, do I pay directly after I get the drink, or do I have to wait till I'm ready to leave like I do in a restaurant? It's not the custom to pay for all your drinks when you're ready to leave. Instead, you pay at the bar each time you get drinks. It helps if you're ready to pay as soon as you're served. And you'll notice that many people wait with their money in their hands. I see. Do I have to give a tip? No. It's not the custom to give a tip. It's very common for friends to buy their drinks together in rounds. This means that each person takes a turn to buy drinks for everybody in the group. It's faster and easier, both for you and for the person serving, if drinks are bought in this way. Naturally, you don't have to have a drink in each round if you don't want one. That's interesting. When you're looking for somewhere to sit, remember that people have to leave their seats to get drinks, etc. So an empty seat may not in fact be available to you. If you're not sure whether a seat is free, ask someone sitting near it. When it's time for another drink, people usually take their glasses back to the bar to be filled again. If you're leaving, the friendly thing to do is to take your glasses back to the bar, thank the person who's been serving you, and say goodbye or goodnight. Thank you, Kevin. This helps me a lot. By the way, what kinds of drinks are available in pubs? Well, you can get both alcoholic and non-alcoholic. Beside alcoholic drinks, such as beer and wine, there is cider, which is made from apples, usually sold in bottles, port, a type of thick sweet wine from Portugal, sherry, which is a type of wine from Spain, and spirits, 
These are a kind of strong alcoholic drinks such as whiskey and brandy. What about non-alcoholic? I don't drink alcohol. Well, they offer all kinds of fruit juices such as orange and tomato. These drinks are usually sold in small bottles. And soft drinks, we often call sweet drinks like Coke and Fanta. They are normally sold in small bottles or cans. And lemonade, which is a clear and sweet drink made with carbonated water. They also serve cordials. What are cordials? Cordials are strong and sweet drinks tasting of fruit, such as lime cordial, black currant cordial. They are often added to other drinks or drunk with water. I don't like sweet drinks. Are there any other non-alcoholic drinks? Yes, mineral water, but it's not available in all pubs. Kevin, one more question: What is VAT? I saw this on most goods in Britain. Well, VAT stands for Value Added Tax. The price shown on most goods in Britain includes a tax of fifteen percent. If you use the retail export scheme, this tax can be returned to you if you take the goods with you when you leave Britain. You may have to spend a certain sum of money before you qualify for the scheme, and you'll have to show your passport. Ask in the shop if they operate the retail export scheme. If they do, the shop assistant will explain how you can get the tax back and fill in a form with you. VAT is also charged on hotel, restaurant bills, theater, cinema tickets, and car hire. Are these refundable? No, it's not refundable in these cases. Thank you very much. I really learned a lot. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.